Um, we're going to talk a little bit about classroom management. Um, I, I just want to start by saying that classroom management looks very different uh, in your externships now than it might in future in-person teacher teaching. So for the most part, what I'm going to talk about is actually going to be more relevant to in-person teaching um, than necessarily Zoom teaching or um, virtual teaching. And partly I want to do that because uh, I've noticed in some of your reflections, most people say there's not really any classroom management issues when you're online. You know, teachers can mute someone. Or, um, there's like not, there tends to not be nearly as many issues. Um, you can't mute a student in class or, uh, you know, it's just a completely different thing. So today we're mostly going to be thinking about face-to-face um, -face teaching because I imagine at some point we'll get back to that and hopefully you'll have the opportunity to implement some of these things. Um, so just getting started quickly, I want you to just take a minute uh, and think about some positive or negative experience in your uh, pre-kindergarten to 12th uh, grade experience that was related to classroom management. And what I mean by classroom management is either the way a teacher decided to run a classroom or it might have been like a, a, a relationship um, between a teacher and a student, one that was especially positive and one that was especially negative. Um, just take a minute and think about that. If we were sitting in class to together, I would say turn to your neighbor and share that memory, but we're not doing that. So uh, let's just have people share out. Um, one of the things, it's funny uh, how certain little memories stick with you throughout all the years. I still have this vivid memory of being in, um, I guess it would have been like eighth grade social studies, or maybe it must maybe seventh grade. And uh, the teacher was lecturing, and I was looking up, just looking at the ceiling, and he like just made this really nasty comment to me about me looking at the ceiling during his lecture, um, as if like that was like some like really big deal. And I, it's just it's just weird how like sometimes those comments stick with you through all those years. Um, and I think it's a good a good way to frame this conversation, getting into it, realizing that we can have a really big impact on our students, um, the way we, we choose to engage with them, the way we speak to them, the way we choose to run our classrooms. Um, is there anyone who could just share one experience? Again, it could be a positive thing or a negative thing, something from your memory about a relationship with a teacher or um, classroom management. Uh, Joseph, thank you. Yeah, so the thing that pops into my head at first was in my high school theory class. Um, it was like 11th grade, and I had a other student in the class who didn't, had learned like traditional theory prior to that. He played guitar and he just played tab and played by ear. And so um, I just remember like constantly each class, um, the teacher would like get down on him about his like inability to read music. And at one point, he we took a quiz um, on uh, on like reading notation, and he like didn't do well on it. So then he got sent to the principal's office. And it was a very odd situation because I was like, it was like you, it's like just because he doesn't know how to do this, like he's like he gets sent to the principal's office. Like I understand him not doing well in the class, like somewhat, but like you don't send him to the principal's office because of that. It was just kind of odd. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting one. And I think that connects to um, one of the C's from Joe Reese's article, the, the content pr portion, that we need to be uh, aware of the way our students interact with our content. Um, and in this situation, it sounds like he had certain skills that maybe weren't being valued by the teacher at that point. Um, other memories of classroom management, either positive or negative, Dotan. Um, when I was in second grade, I was very talkative and um, it was just difficult for me to sit still. Um, and I hadn't learned how to regulate that yet. And so my teacher um, was very helpful with that. And she created like a system with me called paper clips where she would like start the day with a bunch of paper clips in one pocket. And if I was doing something that wasn't good, she would like show me a paper clip and put it in the other pocket and nobody else knew what this system was. So it wasn't like she was shaming me, but she was like making it clear that I wasn't doing something that was helpful to the class. Um, and there was no punishment or reward at the end of the day. If I like had all the paper clips on one side or the other, 
there was no like I get a sticker at the end or I get punched in the face at the end it was just like you should you should be trying to do good and I'm just going to make it clear when you're doing good when you're not and um it was like transformational for me and look at me now Thank you, Dotan. Um, that, that is a fantastic example. And I, I've known many teachers who have, have used similar things where there's sort of this one-on-one -on -one agreement with a particular student, um, usually, as Dotan said, to track a particular behavior and not, um, not necessarily with a consequence, but just a way of showing the student, okay, let's keep track of this and let's see if maybe tomorrow we can do this one less time than today. Um, so that's a great example. And I hope um, I hope you continue to think about that. That's going to maybe come up in a, in a little bit later in this presentation. Anyway, moving along. Um, so this quote was on the wall when I worked at Kip West, Philadelphia. It's a Maya Angelou quote. Um, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And while I think that this was on the wall of that building, um, as a message towards students, I think it was also a, a reminder to teachers that everything that they did um, could impact the way a student felt. And that's the thing that they really carry with them. And I think these, these two examples um, illustrate that, that even years after the fact, we, the way we feel about our teaching, our teachers, um, or our schooling experience is what really sticks with us. All right. Um, so one of the things about classroom management, uh, there has been research that suggests that it is one of the things that new teachers are most um, worried about when they leave their uh, undergrad experience and go off and start teaching. It's also something that is, is relatively difficult to teach. It's something that you, you really learn by experience and you learn by being in the environment. That being said, um, I want us to think throughout today's lesson um, about this, we sort of have a, a spectrum of skills related to classroom management. We have very concrete things we can do that we can apply immediately, hopefully next week in your, your first teaching. Um, things like knowing your students' names, having a solid plan for your class, having procedures or expectations. Um, those are very concrete things that you can say, check off the box, I'm good to go, I have that. There's other things that are sort of generalized over time that relate more to um, relationships with students and sort of navigating uh, complex situations, uh, maybe resolving conflicts bef um, between students, all these things that maybe will come um, a little bit later down the line, and that's perfectly okay. I certainly wasn't ready to manage a class when I was thrown in. Um, and you know, you get that first year and then, and then you learn, and that's, that's okay, that's part of the job. Okay, um, so one, an analogy I like to use in regards to classroom management is the idea of classrooms being more of a garden or a factory. I think it's hopefully pretty obvious that I would argue that classrooms should be more of more like gardens. Um, the picture on the right is from an iPhone factory and you can sort of imagine that in an iPhone factory all the exact same parts come in one side and they go through exactly the same process and then at the end you get an iPhone and it's exactly the same every time. And that's not really how classrooms work and that's not necessarily how I think we should treat students. Unfortunately, standardized testing does encourage that, um, but at least, at least in the realm of classroom management and relationships with students, I think it's much more valuable to see uh, a garden as an analogy. Um, for example, we might plant our green beans over here in the left, and they need, uh, they need those strings to go up and be really healthy and grow, while the, uh, I don't know, this looks like cabbage maybe in the second row, um, those are going to flourish without that at all. And there's certain plants that are going to need certain supplements. Um, you, you put in your eggshells or your coffee grinds under the tomatoes to really help out tomatoes when that wouldn't necessarily be um, necessary for a different plant. In some sense, we're sort of giving students all the same. We're going to water all the plants and they're all going to get sunshine, but we also have to give sort of individual attention to each plant or each student to ensure that uh, the appropriate vegetable comes out. Anyway, that's just an analogy I made up. Okay, getting into my first topic, uh, physical space. Uh, just kidding, because we're on Zoom. Um, so I, this is a, a PowerPoint that I, I've been using for a few semesters now, and I, was, I thought about going back and completely changing it, but I think it's also good to think about um, a little bit about what a physical space might 
um, help you with or might prevent you from doing uh, in a physical classroom, um, but also thinking about like what are the issues with Zoom. So just quickly, um, rather than sharing about physical space, I want to hear uh, based on your observation so far, what has classroom management look like in the virtual environment? And again, I've heard from some, I've read some of the observations, um, but I would love to hear some people just quickly explain either experience or just, or just like a lack of um, experiences of classroom management in the Zoom setting. And if we can get some folks maybe we haven't heard from, I see some cameras off, which is okay, but I would love to also hear from people uh, and just hear what you got to say. I know I know there are people out there who have already thought about this because they put it in their observation. So if you would just share with the class. Eva, go. So in, in my classroom, there was a lot of very ADHD behaviors. Uh, students unable to sit still, moving around in their own physical space, playing with things, reading other things. So rather than the teacher get very frustrated and yell at the students to sit down and focus, she kind of worked with the students. Um, there was a song uh, where you make, a, you make a pot of stew and you think, sing about things that you put in your pot of stew. And one of the very active students went off and gathered physical things to put in his pot of stew. Rather than um, you know, get him in trouble for not sitting down and participating in the song with everyone else, when it was his, when it was his turn, he said, here's my pot of stew. And he showed us all about his pot of stew and everything that was in it. And we sang about his pot of stew and then we carried on with the class. And it was rather than um, see his like absence as disruption or as very rude, they saw that, no, he was really engaged in this pot of stew song. He was getting into a flow, going around and gathering things for his pot of stew. And he wanted to share that with us. With us. So I, I thought that was a really cool example. <laughs> Thank you, Manny. Um, but yeah, um, I thought that was really yeah, Thank you for sharing. I think, and that, that's a good reminder that in this environment, we are sort of reaching into people's homes in this strange way that, that didn't happen in person. Um, and that we can't, we can't control what's going on in someone's house via Zoom. You know, we have to sort of be accepting of, of whatever is going on. And I think that's a good example of, um, you know, maybe that's actually maybe that was actually a really positive experience that that student couldn't have had in person. Um, that that time to go run around really quickly and grab some stuff and bring it back and show it to the class. Um, I can certainly see a lot of teachers saying, "Oh, that wouldn't work out in my class." Oh, I keep going the wrong way. Um, but on Zoom, it was it was a great opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Let's go. Let's go one more. Can, um, I, can I jump in on that too, Peter? Absolutely. You know, it's funny you wrote physical space, haha, just kidding, Zoom. But one of the things that I notice as a student or a TA in my different classes is how my professors are constricted or helped by the choices that they make in whether they're sitting or standing. And mm -hmm. like one of my professors teaches like me from a bedroom. And so now she's got like a standing desk in there so she can actually move. But before she was like, I can't move because if I move like this much and I try to tilt my camera, everybody can see my bed and that just feels so unprofessional. And so it's just something to think about that physical space, even in a virtual setting, still has such an important role in education. Absolutely. I hope you guys don't see my physical space and think, how unprofessional to teach from the pet shop. <laughs> um, Send me an email if you think that. Hopefully you're not you're not thinking that about me. Peter, but. they just wish you had real pets behind you instead uh, of that's right. Yeah, we should just get some real pets for the pet shop. <laughs> I'm incredibly jealous of the number of instruments you have at your disposal. At I know, time. I can just grab anything I want and play it anytime. No, no, I don't actually do that, but I could. Um, and any other comments about uh, just observations? Uh, yes, Kyle. Yeah, so the third grade classes like in the beginning of the observations, like they've been working a lot on like online program stuff. And I think there was one point where when the teacher was explaining like the procedures and all that, one of the students just randomly called out, can we log on now? But like, instead of just like saying like, hey, don't call out, he pretty much said, not yet, but I'm glad to see you're excited. So just to like have that positive like engagement. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that I think carries directly into the face-to-face -face teaching, um, that it is, 
you know, when you have these goals, sometimes as a new teacher, having a perfectly silent class where every student raises their hand before they speak. Um, and that can lead to a lot of frustration if you sort of treat that as a red line. Um, and while we don't want to encourage students to always be calling out and yelling, um, sometimes it is way more effective just to guide that energy into whatever that student is planning on doing rather than saying, raise your hand or ask me later. Yeah, just, just wait a second, we'll get there. Second, I think is, is a perfect example. Thank you, Kyle. Okay, um, just quickly, because you did some reading for today, um, Jill Reese is a Temple grad. She used to teach this class, actually, TGM, um, and now she's at Fredonia State. Um, she's a music ed professor there. Um, but her four C's in the article were content, communication, commendation, commendation excuse me, and consistency. Um, and just really quickly running through these, and then I want to hear uh, some examples either from your externship or from some of the videos I posted. Um, content generally refers to presenting things that students are going to be interested, planning your lessons in a way that will engage students um, and give them some, something to focus on. When we present things that students aren't interested or doesn't engage in, they're more likely to be distracted and to... Um, Call, now, I don't want to say cause issues, but uh, maybe not contribute to the learning in, in the classroom. Uh, communication, obviously, we need to be able to communicate with our students. Um, this happens in all kinds of scenarios, um, but I, I think it's really, really important that students know that we are willing to listen to them. Maybe not in that exact moment. Maybe it has to be, can I come back to you in two minutes? Can you speak to me at the end of class? Can you write me an email? Something, you know, something. But students need to know that they can communicate and that you're willing to listen to whatever their issues happen to be. Um, commendation, the idea that we need to recognize the good things that our students are doing. Um, almost every single direction or action can be reframed from a negative into a positive, where you're pointing out what students should be doing rather than pointing out what they shouldn't be doing. Um, that can really help build self-esteem for a lot of students and also just creates a positive environment in the classroom. Finally, finally just being consistent. Um, when you have tons and tons of students, they sometimes notice, not always, but sometimes notice if you are treating one student the other way and that perception can lead to a lot of distrust um, or sort of lack of buy-in on those students part um, so just thinking about those four have you seen those at all in your externship or in those short little video clips that um, that you looked at before today if you can use your blue hand um, then I can I know right away that you're trying to to raise a hand Again, I would love to hear from some folks maybe we haven't heard from today or in the past few days. Go ahead, Casey. Thank you, Andrew. Especially on a digital platform, the biggest source of um, classroom management I've noticed is um, positive affirmation. When um, a teacher when the teacher I observe realizes a student's not participating, they'll say, I like how so-and-so is participating, and they draw attention to the positive behavior, and students are more likely to reflect that. And um, even in the um, videos we watched where there was in-person classes, um, that seems to be the most um, consistently positive response because students want that praise and they feel valued when they are recognized for positive behavior. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that, and again, that that carries right into face-to-face -face teaching. Um, the exact same thing is the case. Um, I know specifically with some of the people I've um, given feedback for their musical greeting, I've asked you. You might even plan specific things that you're going to commendate or say throughout your lesson, um, just so you don't forget about it. You might put a little um, mark in your lesson, say, "Okay, I'm going to point out one student right here who is singing along, or one student who is demonstrating the motions or participating in a certain way." Um, and eventually, that becomes natural. But it's it's helpful at the beginning to just pick a few spots. Say, "I'm going to do. I'm going to." Complement three different students at these different spots just to make sure that that's happening in your classroom. Okay, um, because I know um, I want to move into externship groups by about 1030. I want to go ahead and look at two quick videos. I believe one of them you saw last night um, or whenever you did your, your work for today. 
And then one of them um, you might not have seen yet. So let me make sure I'm sharing all the good stuff. Optimize for video clip. All right, um, just a quick context. Um, Uncommon Schools is a charter school network that has published a lot of teacher training materials. Um, they were very widely adapted at one of the schools where I worked and that's sort of where I, I found about out about them. Um, I do want to preface this that they have Uncommon Schools and a lot of other no excuse charter schools have received a lot of criticism about their sort of rigid um, discipline structures. Um, I don't think that is necessarily represented in either of these videos, but I just wanted to put that out there as sort of an acknowledgement. Um, this first one, you might, I'd say at the very beginning, you might sort of get a sense that this is a very rigid classroom, but we can talk about that afterwards. All right, uh, it's short. We'll probably watch it twice, and then uh, I just want to hear your thoughts. I want you to, like, as much as possible, tune into all the little steps that she does to get these students through this transition. that one more time um, and again just I want you to think about so the teacher's goal is to get students from their desks to the carpet and get right into the lesson what are like all the individual steps that she's going through to make sure that happens one more time All right, I would love to hear um, a few thoughts about, oops, and it was already replied, um, about what this teacher is doing to ensure that students are getting um, from their desk to the carpet quickly, efficiently, effectively, safely, all of those things. I'm looking at you now, so I, uh, but go ahead and just jump in. Uh, Joseph. Sorry, I wasn't unmuted. Um, so they start off with just kind of like a preparatory thing of just saying and to get them ready for what they're about to do. And then they shake out their hands. And the cool thing I think was that they, a teacher did like a nonverbal cue for each step of getting up. So instead of like saying one, like let's stand up, like making it super verbal, they just like put one finger up, to like stand up and, and stuff like that. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, absolutely. This is clearly a procedure that they probably have practiced many, many times and that the students very much have internalized. And one of the things I want to point out about that is there, uh, she's sort of like riding this wave between um, giving them each step, but like going in the process with them. So there are some students who move a little bit before she says go, but she's not stopping and say stop, don't, don't go yet. She knows that they're, they've already learned this procedure. This is something where they're pretty much going to get there just the way they need to and she can sort of ride that wave with them rather than being the, the stop sign between um, those two environments. Other things you might have noticed? So I want to piggyback off of uh, what Joseph was saying. Um, the nonverbal part is actually super important and crucial because that means the students have to have their eyes on you. Um, it means their eyes can't be wandering other places. Um, so they got to know what's coming next. And the only way they can know what's coming next is by looking at you. And that's super like important. Um, the other thing, I really liked the how she started it with putting their hands up. Kids like to fidget with their hands. They like to touch things. They like to play with pencils. They like to do stuff. So isolating that and put, making them put their hands up and then they start the process of getting uh, out of the chair. Make sure that they're all um, doing this, doing it together. Absolutely. I think those are, are two great points um, that 
sometimes uh, by asking kids to show a certain thing, we are um, getting them to do something without directly asking them. So rather than saying, don't touch your papers or don't play with your pencil or don't move around in your seat, the direction is just put your hands in there and wave them out. That prevents all of those things without having to tell a kid not to do something. Also just that sense of like adding some kind of movement to your transition. Um, especially for younger kids is really, really helpful because it just, you know, sitting all day is tough. I mean, even for me as an adult. Um, so using those times in between uh, sort of the structured parts of the lesson to let students get out some of that motion can be, can be very helpful. Uh, Dotan, and then we're going to go to the next video. Um, yes, I, I like the video and I think she was effective in her goal. Um, I thought, I mean, I watched this for the reflection. Um, I thought it was something different that I hadn't watched yet. And I was like bracing for like a mean robot teacher. Um, but I think the difference is that her directions were encouraging and her excitement was showing. And I think that if um, there are some teachers who their primary goal is to make sure that the students are like behaving and the way that they do that is by starting out angry so they teach the entire day angry so that if students talk out of turn or make a disruption at all once it's like explosive um, instead of like starting friendly and encouraging and then ending up getting angry and then explosive it's like some teachers i mean not so much anymore but i'm sure we all have had teachers like this when we were younger um who just seemed angry when they were telling us how to do subtraction like there's no reason to be angry and she was clearly encouraging um and and happy to be there and excited and so the kids were excited to follow her directions and they weren't scared to follow her directions absolutely and that, and that fits right into the positive framing that hopefully you saw in another one of those videos um Dotan, make sure you change the battery in your smoke detector. Um, we're going to watch one more. Um, and rather than having a big conversation, because like I said, I want to get you into groups and, and give you plenty of time to work today, I may just sort of narrate through some of this. Um, so this is one you didn't see for homework. Um, Uncommon Schools has this thing they refer to as the joy factor. I think that's a pretty corny title, but, but the idea is that when you're teaching, you should be into it and you should be happy and you should be, uh, a lot of what Dotan just said, you should be really showing positive side. Um, so this is a, a, what I would guess would be a kindergarten or maybe even pre-K reading lesson. Um, and it's in a small group, um, but just take a look at all the, all the little things that this teacher does to keep the students moving, keep them engaged, stay really positive, but also sort of um, hold them to a certain amount of expectations. Here we go. The sound is j. What sound? J. J. What sound? J. Ooh, that's a quick sound. Say it quick in your mouth. J. What sound? J. J. What sound? J. Imai, that sound is? J. Quadir, that sound is? J. J. What sound? J. J. What sound? J. J. Notice there that he's not, not, there's nothing negative about that. He's just asking the student to repeat until he gets it right. He's not telling them that it's wrong or even conveying any kind of negative um, expression with his face. It's just do it again, do it again in a very positive way. What sound? Yeah. Nice job. Mercy, that sound is? Yeah. Nice job. Let's do some more sound. This sound is good. What sound? Good. Good. What sound? Good. Shh. Return. Say it fast. What sound? What sound? Ooh, let's play a teacher versus student game. Uh oh, earlier game we played before. Mr. Davis, sad face. Notice he's letting them make a little noise here. He's not making a big deal about that at all. If I win, I get to cross. You guys, if you win, you get to cross. All right, here's how you win. Say all your sounds and you win. Ready? Amia, leave it right there. Hold it in your hand. All right, really quick thing there. So this student gets up to throw away her tissue. Um, and while that's a pretty, uh, pretty innocent thing, um, I think he wants to maintain the expectation that students are going to stay in their seat. So it just in this real low, quiet voice, he says, leave it there. Um, rather than saying, don't throw your trash out, he tells her in a positive framed way what to do rather than what not to do. She's real quick to turn around and sit back down. Here we go. You need four sounds to win our game. Don't get tricked. 
Five, four, three, two, one. Say fast. Five, four, three, two, one. Say fast. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Say fast. Last one. Five, four, three, two, one. Say fast. Notice that each time when he's giving that number, he's mouthing it. Um, he, he's actually saying almost completely silent as a reminder to the students that they don't need to say anything in between each of these, that it should be a silent time. Mr. Davis won. No! Ah, oh, Scholars won. All right. Oh, I need a friend. Jaden, Ms. Recup. This is Let's a common technique Recup where come up this um, time. teachers... You should just see the Australian star hands in your lap. Oh, just like... My all their students' names um, and randomly pick out one student. That sort of like removes the sense that uh, you're playing favorites with any particular student. You show them it's completely random and then they can't, they can't complain about Let's it. Let's see, I like how... Got the mystery cup. Who is the mystery cup gonna choose today? Yeah. Not not you. Let's see, we need someone from... You guys. Quadir. I like Quadir. Are you going to cross out, Scholar Face? Who are you going to cross out? Okay, go up. Nice job. What do you say, Quadir? Nice job. Give Quadir one clap. Two claps. Freeze clap. My turn. Watch me. Your turn. All right, let's keep. All right, one or two last things before uh, we break out. Just just think about for a second um, the way he presented that game. It wasn't really a game, right? There was there was like almost no way that the students couldn't win that game. Um, but he presents in a way where they get to feel a little competitive and they, they get pulled into this lesson and all you know all they're doing is reading four sounds. Um, at, at the very end there, again, you see sort of this, this transition where he's allowing them, in this case, it's just claps of giving them some opportunity to celebrate their teammates, to make some noise and, and um, engage in some physical activity. All right, that's all the time we have for classroom man management. Now we will continue to talk about it a little bit later in the semester. Um, for the rest of class, we're gonna send you into breakout groups 